Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this special event, part of the Victorian Nature Festival. My name is Mark Rodrigue. I'm with Parks Victoria, and we're here for a session this afternoon exploring Victoria's forest of the sea. Today, we're going to take a bit of a journey, having a bit of a look at some of the, uh, the plants and the animals that depend upon them that live here in Victoria's marine environment. We're very lucky to have a system of parks, which we'll talk about as well, uh, that we look after the Victorian Marine National Parks and Marine Sanctuaries. We're going to spend a bit of time trying to understand the diversity of plants that happen to live within our environment, but also uh, spend some time looking also at some of the challenges uh, that some of these environments uh, face. Um, what we'd like to do this afternoon is encourage you to use the chat, uh, the, the little uh, icon at the top of your screen, which has got a question on it, uh, should be able to be used to turn on a sidebar, which you can then post your questions. Uh, Nicola's uh, waiting in the background there, uh, looking forward to uh, posting your questions up on the uh, on the website. And we're going to take those questions, have a go through uh, working our way through those towards the end of the session. Uh, if you do have any challenges along the way, uh, Nicola's on, on standby. She's got the, uh, the hotline ready. Uh, you might hear the voice of God coming through occasionally when she do, gives me some instructions about things that are not working, but certainly very keen to uh, get your questions. Uh, but please start off by just introducing yourself to everybody. Just say good day, uh, put your name and uh, where you're from. Uh, it'd be really lovely to see uh, how many different people uh, are attending this afternoon. Uh, we'll probably do the presentation for uh, for a little while. I'm going to interrupt the presentation every now and then because I've got some bits of live. I mean, this is a live event, so I thought we better do some live stuff rather than just share screens with you the whole afternoon. And hopefully that'll give you a bit more insight into some of the diversity of our fantastic plants here in Victoria. Let's switch over now and move into the presentation mode. So the title of our uh, uh, presentation this afternoon is exploring Victoria's forests of the sea. And my email address is there. If you've got any queries about this, the content we're talking about today, or anything else in relation to Victoria's marine national park system, very, very happy to hear from you. Before we start our presentation, though, I just want to start by paying my respect to Victoria's traditional owners, their elders, past, present, and emerging across Victoria. In my own case, I live down in Barwon Heads with a lovely. Uh, Lovely chilly bow and heads today. We've had everything, I think, from hail to sunshine to rain to wind, and uh, the sun's out at the moment, but I don't think it's going to be lasting too long. But I'm definitely in whatever wrong country uh, in the area just south of Geelong. When we start to think about traditional owners of Victoria, they've had a very long continuous connection uh, with the sea, with the Victorian environment generally, but in particular with the sea uh, for many, many thousands of years. The, uh, the beautiful illustration actually is, uh, is a museum piece uh, in the British Museum. And if you look closely, one of the things you'll notice about it is it's actually a piece of bull kelp. This artifact uh, was collected some time ago and it represents part of that continuing use of the marine environment for its natural resources. Um, a great study that was undertaken a couple of years back uh, had a look at understanding Aboriginal uses of seaweeds across temperate Australia uh, through looking through the archives, historical records. And what they found within that, that marine marine materials, particularly seaweeds, were used for a whole range of different purposes, including cultural activities, ceremonies, uh, for medicines, clothing, um, cultural history for food, fishing, shelter, and for domestic uses. And the beautiful, uh, beautiful bag that you can see that's been made there is actually something used for carrying water uh, from a plant called Davilia potatorum, or otherwise known to us as bull kelp. It's something which uh, many of you be familiar with if you, if you head out onto the Victorian open coast. It's that very thick, leathery uh, algae, big brown algae that sometimes gets ripped up in storms and washes up in large quantities on the beaches where I live down here in Barwon Heads. Um, it's a plant that does grow um, all the way down through to some of the sub-Antarctic islands. So it's very much a cool water uh, marine plant um, and it's one that we'll come back to and touch on a little bit later on. Before we start talking more specifically about the plants, I want to go, give you a little bit more of an overview of Victoria's marine environment for those of you less familiar. When we have this fantastic view of Victoria as seen from space, now we don't see the lines, we don't see the state boundaries, we don't see the roads, but what we can see is this fantastic southward facing coastline stretching the Pacific from the Pacific Ocean over in the, wet, uh, over in the east, uh, past Mallacoota, all the way through to Discovery Bay uh, in the western part of Victoria. You can also see, if you look closely, uh, the large embayments like Port Phillip, um, you can also see a bit of Western Port, a bit obscured by cloud and a little bit of corner inlet in there. Um, Victoria has got this 
wonderful south facing coastline and as we move across the state one of the things that's important to understand is that it's got this transition from the pacific to the southern cool waters of the southern ocean this interest image is quite interesting uh, in that it's actually got in the background you can actually see a whole lot of swirls and uh, material that's moving around we'll come back and touch on those but these are actually plankton blooms that are occurring out there in the southern ocean Victoria is very fortunate to have a very comprehensive park and reserve system. Uh, we've, uh, unlike many of the other parts of Australia, we've got around about 15% of our land covered by uh, parks, national parks and reserves. We also have along our coastline a wonderful collection of marine protected areas that protect the marine biodiversity of our environment uh, for future generations. Uh, these include fantastic sites uh, of very important cultural significance. They have, um, they have uh, enormous numbers of sites and particularly, as I mentioned earlier, Aboriginal use of the coast was incredibly important. We have incredible landscapes uh, such as the magnificent Grampians National Park in the western part of Victoria. Interestingly, again, if you look at the lands landscape, you can actually see the layers of rock signifying the fact that this was in fact once upon a time part of the marine environment in itself and the sandstone rocks that are there. And of course, we've got these wonderful coastal environments such as the Port Campbell National Park with the world famous 12 apostles, again, telling us a story of past times when sea levels were higher than what they are today. And you can see that through the banding of the rocks there. But when we get under the water, we do have this incredible underwater environment as well. And many people, particularly those from other states, don't often recognise that Victoria has got one of the most diverse, richest and certainly unique in, uh, marine environments in Australia and certainly in, in the world. Very, very colourful environment. Uh, it's full of all sorts of interesting creatures. For, and this is a protected area down at Point Addis uh, between Torquay and Anglesey. Um, and it's home to a, a wide range of fish and invertebrates, uh, as well as the marine plants that uh, make the kelp forest we're going to be talking more about today. Beautiful animals such as this magnificent weedy sea dragon, our um, state emblem and the blue devil fish keeping it company. Victoria's marine protected area system actually extends from one end of the state to the other. We have 24 highly protected marine national parks and marine sanctuaries and six other reserves that are, allow for some forms of recreational fishing and other activities, uh, particularly in the South Gippsland area. These marine national parks and marine sanctuaries were established in 2002 and they're coming up next year to their 20th anniversary. So we're looking forward to celebrating with you uh, some of the things that we've learned, some of the achievements along the way that ourselves, our partners and of course our community have helped us out with along this journey. These areas are like national parks on the land, areas where taking of things, removal of things, uh, and destroying things basically is prohibited. So fishing and removal of things like uh, shells and um, animals from the from the intertidal area is actually prohibited. In the same way that you'd not expect to do these sorts of activities in a national park on the land, our marine national parks and our marine sanctuaries are fully protected uh, for all people, for all time and for nature. We're going to have a little bit of a look now through at some of the different habitats that we do find along the Victorian coast and zone back into talking specifically about the habitat that we're most interested in today, which is our kelp forest environments or our forests of the sea. We do have a, a fantastic diversity of habitats as we move across the coast. In the area between the high and low tide mark, uh, we have these wonderful intertidal reefs. Uh, Victoria has large sections of reef that are, extend out and beyond the, beyond the surface. Um, but they also are covered by water periodically. As we move down and underneath the surface of the water, uh, these reefs uh, do provide more permanent home for things like plants. And as we go into the deeper water, you've got a range of different sorts of invertebrate animals uh, that live there as well, such as these beautiful yellow zoanthids. And in very deep waters, it's the uh, animal life, the sponges, the sea whips you can see here that provide homes or shelter for the animals that might live there. We're fortunate to have some flowering plants that also live in different parts, very important flowering plants called sea grasses that like uh, grasses on the land use sunlight and they provide habitat and, and shelter for a whole range of different things that we'll come back and touch on a little bit later. 
Um, in terms of some of the large areas of the coast, these are areas that are dominated by what we call soft sediments, so sand and other material. Uh, these materials themselves might not seem like rich places for life, but as you can see in this photo, uh, there are lots of things that live in between the sand grains that make their way across the surface uh, looking for things like uh, looking for their food, such as these snails on a mudflat surface. Uh, in turn, these things are very important food for a range of other things that we perhaps recognise more readily, such as shorebirds that use these areas extensively. We have forests on the, on the coast, uh, mangrove areas, and also salt marshes that also make up important habitats as we talk about our marine and coastal environments. These areas are periodically inundated by seawater and therefore are definitely part of the marine environment or influenced very much by the marine environment. Even though this looks like a very dry place, it uh, sometimes gets seawater in uh, at particular high tides. Um, and then, of course, there's those vast areas of blue, the open water environments that extend beyond the shoreline. Um, and there's a range of animals from the jellyfish and whales that might move through this area uh, through to uh, through to things like the um, uh, whales that visit us periodically every winter. Today, we're going to be focusing largely on kelp forests and looking essentially at how these environments provide us uh, provide food, provide shelter for a range of different kinds of living things. These kelp forest environments are really rich places and just like forests on the land where the trees provide shelter, they provide food, you'll find things living down around the base, you'll find things on the trunk of a tree or up in the canopy. Um, similarly, in a kelp forest environment, you'll find a range of different sorts of animals and plants occupying different niches or different part, parts of that environment. Let's have a look at a bit of a video clip to just show some of the things that might live in a kelp forest environment. So here we've got, this is uh, just some footage taken in different parts of Victoria. Um, you've got here a range of the common uh, kelp, some of the green seaweeds there, and uh, typically of Victoria, and certainly today's a good example. Uh, a lot of these plants are used to coping with a fairly high energy environment, lots of movement of water backwards and forwards as the, uh, as the waves roll in. They provide homes for animals down below, uh, up in the canopy itself, so things like fish and sharks. Um, you can see here, this is over in the eastern part of the state. They also provide uh, places for foraging for animals like our beautiful Australian fur seals. This is actually taken at Beware Reef over in East Gippsland. So these kelp forest environments really truly are dynamic environments. They're rich environments. They're places where lots of different types of living things can be found. And there's certainly some great chances for people to go out and experience these areas in spite of the chilly weather and the uh, uh, and the, the often rough conditions when you pick your days. Some of our kelp forests are some of the most fascinating places to go snorkeling and or diving. Let's have a, before we get into talking specifically about some of the plants that make their home in Victoria, I want to talk a little bit about some of the science um, that sits behind and uh, provides a bit of an understanding of why different plants in the sea have got some very different characteristics to those that live on the land. Clearly they have to cope with living in an aquatic environment and that presents it's in itself some challenges. One of the things that many of you would be aware of is that the sea looks blue and the reason why it looks blue is that most of the light that hits the surface is actually absorbed. Uh, many of you would be familiar with the spectrum of light um, and it's interesting to know what happens to light as it passes down through seawater as certain colours are absorbed. A couple of years ago, pre-COVID, I was very fortunate to go and do some diving in South America. It feels like a million years ago today, but I was there specifically at a, a beautiful marine protected area called Malpelo off the coast of Colombia, um, primarily to go and see uh, the animals such as this one in the, in the slide here, hammerhead sharks, big schools of hammerheads and other uh, big pelagic fish. What you can see though, and this is a shot I took at about probably 28, 30 metres below the surface, is that blue environment. This is a photo taken without a flash, and it just shows what light is like once you actually get down into some of those deeper waters. Uh, I'll give you another illustration of that. Here's a photo I took re relatively close to the bottom. Um, I did have my flash on, but as you can see, I was probably some distance away, and the flash is only just starting to pick up some of the colours that have disappeared as light's passing through the water and gives that much more sort of a, a washed out kind of look. But when I turn the flash on, um, you can see things in their true actual colours. So the red light that normally would be reaching, uh, the red light that normally wouldn't be reaching the bottom here, actually now is being presented by my flash and all of the things in the photo show up in their glorious colour. Oh, and by the way, that's a moray. As I'm saying, 
light actually changes as it goes down through the water, um, with the red light actually disappearing sort of in the top couple of metres. Uh, as you move down through the spectrum, um, light actually diminishes as it, on its way down through in, to the greater depths. So an animal like this beautiful pink octopus you can see in the, in the diagram here uh, might look nice and pink when it's up near the surface. But if you went down to 20 metres and had a look, tried to look at the same pink octopus, it would actually be quite dark in colour. An interesting adaptation that a lot of um, marine animals actually have, particularly things that live in deeper water, is they use red colour as a, as a simple way of actually camouflaging themselves at depth. That red colour uh, in the absence of red light uh, makes them black and therefore harder to see, makes them a little bit easier to hide themselves and avoid predators. Uh, in this diagram, you can actually see what happens to light using the, the, the light spectrum. And as you'll notice, if you look to the right hand side of both the diagram for the open ocean on the left or the diagram for our coastal waters, where there's a lot more sediment and other material obscuring the water, uh, making it a little bit more difficult for light to penetrate, is that some of those colours just simply don't get uh, anywhere down. If you think about what that means from a plant perspective, it's important to think that these things actually have an influence on where plants can actually get their light from. And for plants on our land that are in full open light, uh, they use lots of, uh, they use the direct sunlight. They get that sunlight and they've got that uh, wonderful green color. I'm gonna switch off the, uh, the presentation for a moment and just go back to putting myself back up on the screen because I've got a couple of things I'd like to share with you. Just better turn my kettle on for a moment um, and we'll get something going here. So firstly, excuse the noise of the kettle in the background. Uh, here's a bit of tonight's dinner. Just went out the back and picked some parsley, um, green plants, as you'll find them on the land. Um, these are obviously designed for and very used to the idea of actually living in, in, uh, in full sunlight. But when we start to look at marine plants, there are some green ones. And here's a bit of sea lettuce. We'll come back and have a look at some of these in a moment. Sorry, it's a bit trippy, so I just have to move my tray across. Got some things like sea lettuce. Uh, which is a bright green coloured plant. We've got lots of brown plants, uh, such as this uh, beautiful Cystophora we've got here. Um, and we've also got some plants that are red in colour. We'll come back and have a look at some of those in a moment. But what I wanted to show you in this first part of the, part of the um, demonstration is just some of the things that are interesting about marine plants. I have been down the beach this morning, fortunately, five kilometres, we're in lockdown in here in the city of Greater Geelong as well, and uh, I'm able to get to the beach. But I thought I'd collect a nice piece of this beautiful Aclonia. Um, this is one of the more common kelps that are found on the Victorian coastline. In fact, it's, its name is actually common kelp. And you'll notice that it's a brown colour. It's certainly a very different colour to that of the green, uh, green parsley that I've got in my other hand. And you might be wondering, well, what, what's the, why are these plants sometimes brown, sometimes green, and sometimes red? And what's, the, what's it all got to do with? I've got a little bit of magic to show you. The reason for having the kettle going in the background, I'm just pouring myself a lovely glass of hot water here. I'm going to give you a little bit of a demonstration of just what happens, um, what these plants are. So I'm going to take a little a blade of the, uh, the blade of the thing. Hopefully it won't burn my hand too much. I'm going to pop the seaweed into the glass of water. Now, what I want you to notice is just what happens when we pull that brown seaweed out. Hopefully you were able to see the colour changes occur there. If you missed it, I'll try it again, just using a slightly bigger piece this time perhaps. Um, and what you can see quite clearly is that this is actually a green plant that has actually got some extra colours within it. So you can see that uh, brown colours now starting to sort of uh, cloud up, make myself look like I've got a cup of tea here. Again, because I didn't have it quite on the screen, just show you that there's no trick and trickery in, in all of this uh, internet kind of stuff. I'll hold the glass up this time. Brown seaweed, hold it nice and close to the camera. Brown into the hot water. This is a party trick you want to try at home. And you can see that that brown colours now are disappeared. The glass is actually starting to get very hot, but it's also starting to turn into this tepid, tea colour. So what's all, all that got to do with kelp forests? Well, it's actually important that we uh, start to think about our, um, start to think about what the plants have to allow themselves to be able to cope. Back into the presentation slides. So if we, we talk about plants in marine environments, 
the challenge that they face is that they have different depths of water and that big problem of actually light is actually disappearing as we go deeper into the into the uh, into the water environment. Different sorts of marine plants, different groups, and we don't need to worry too much unless you're a scientist in, in all the different names that are there, but they actually have a group of different kinds of pigments that are in them. Green plants, um, like the green algae, mainly have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. They're the main colours that actually uh, they use for absorbing sunlight. They trap that sunlight energy, and through the process of photosynthesis, they actually make food materials, they make sugars, um, and they also release oxygen. But all of the other kinds of plants that we were talking about, um, so the things like uh, the red algae, the brown algae, you'll notice if you look closely, they have these other pigments in there as well. And the reason for that is that these other pigments actually work in a different part of the light spectrum, and they allow these plants to be able to cope with living at depth. Uh, this next one's a bit, bit heavy in terms of the science of it, but it's basically just simply looking at what's going on in a number of these different pigments. And if you look at the colour scheme across the top, you'll see which parts of the spectrum um, the plants are actually using to make their food or for photosynthesising. We just think about green plants or green algae, land plants or green algae. They have this chlorophyll A, uh, which has a peak around red and also in a, in a blue part of the spectrum. This red part of the spectrum, as we've mentioned already, is not present once you start to go down deeper into the water. So what we have instead is a bunch of other pigments that work in this yellow, green, and even into the, into the blue section of the light spectrum, allowing those plants then to survive at greater depth and continue to use the sunlight energy that's actually reaching them in order to make their food. That's why we have green, brown, and red marine plants. Let's go into now start to have a look at some of that diversity. Firstly, um, we're going to talk a bit about the really little plants now that you could hardly call them forests, but they play an incredibly important role in terms of thinking about the life in the ocean full stop. These tiny things referred to as the phytoplankton, phyto meaning using light and plankton meaning to wander or to drift, are microscopic generally, although there are some larger ones that are actually visible to the naked eye, um, or sometimes called, a, there's a really good word to use at the next, and your next, uh, uh, next um, a crossword puzzle, the microphytobenthos, which is talking about little tiny things that use light that live on the benthos, which is the bottom of the sea. Um, these are little tiny things that actually, instead of floating around like the plankton do, they live on the surface of things like mud um, and sand, and they're a really important source of food for a lot of our grazing animals. Um, just to give you an idea, and again, to illustrate it in fairly simple terms, we've got the sunlight, um, energy coming in through the water, the tiny, phytoplankton actually making food, uh, trapping that sunlight energy, making sugars growing. These in turn become food for a bunch of animals that can filter the water, take these particles from the water, and in turn become food for things like fish, which feed larger fish, which feed larger, uh, which might feed things like mammals, um, which might go on to feed something like a killer whale. Incredibly important, and they do actually have a very important role in terms of life on our planet as we know it. They, um, they're starting point for most of our marine food chains. They actually are responsible for about 50% of global photosynthesis. So they truly are the great lungs of the earth. They're the things that are actually making uh, the oxygen on our planet and responsible for about half of the world's oxygen. They also trap carbon uh, from the atmosphere and eventually sink to the sea floor where they are often tied up in the sediments for a long period of time and sometimes becoming rock itself. So they're a carbon sink in many ways. When we start to think about plankton, how do you go out about going to see them? Well, this wonderful uh, image taken from Australia's Ocean Odyssey, the ABC journey down the East Australian current, um, is showing you what a plankton net looks like. Basically, it's a big long net uh, big like stocking-like net with very, very fine pores on the side. And right at the very end, it's got a small collecting vial that allows the seawater to pass out. But using the small filter that's in there, it allows the plankton to be uh, concentrated and therefore to be able to look at under a microscope. There's a whole bunch of different types of phytoplankton. 
And they are, as I said, incredibly important in terms of the way that they make food and provide food and kick off, kickstart all of our ocean, many of our ocean food chains. Certainly out in the open ocean, it's these sorts of things that are actually out there making the food. The forests of the sea, the seaweeds or the, the kelps as we know, and the other types of uh, large macroalgae uh, are found only in areas where they can actually attach themselves to something solid. So they generally tend to be found around the coast, although there are a couple that are actually known to drift and live on the surface of the seawater. Um, so there's a bunch of different types of uh, phytoplankton. A couple of them are actually quite well known to us because they appear every now and then in quite large numbers. I thought I'd share with you though, some beautiful magnification vintage from the same documentary, Australia's, Australia's Ocean Odyssey just showing you under very high 5,000 times magnification what these phytoplankton actually look like. You'll notice that many of them have got pigments within them and these pigments, the ones we talked about a moment ago, that trap that sunlight energy and use that to uh, convert simple materials, carbon dioxide and water into sugars and to oxygen. In turn, these tiny plants are consumed by a range of animals. Uh, such as this copepod. These are extraordinarily numerous in the, in the world's oceans. You can see, in fact, inside the uh, copepod, you can see the pigments uh, remaining from the plankton. In turn, these might be eaten by, uh, by animals like uh, jellyfish or even Nemo, eaten by larger fish, which in turn get eaten by animals like seals, which in turn might get eaten by something like a shark. So all in all, those phytoplankton are incredibly important to life in the ocean and all the things that we love or many of the larger animals that we love in the ocean um, actually depend ultimately on those tiny little forests of the sea, uh, the phytoplankton. This is a bit of a satellite image that's taken to look at essentially where phytoplankton are found in large quantities. And in January, our summertime, you'll notice that um, a large part of the continent of Antarctica has these bright red spots on it. Those bright red spots indicate very, very high concentrations of phytoplankton in the water. And that rich productivity is what in fact means that animals from whales through to seals, through to penguins, etc., cetera, um, spend their time around that coast of Antarctica, feeding up, um, getting themselves nice and ready for their big journeys, uh, for many of them making their big journeys. At the other time of the year, during our winter time, you'll notice that the southern waters become a lot less productive. Up there in the north, however, things are absolutely going through the roof in terms of productivity. Those bright red spots all the way across from North America through to Europe and, and to Eastern Asia, um, really high productivity uh, and really kickstarting those magnificent food chains that give, give rise to such a wonderful diversity of marine life in that part of the world. One, uh, one plant, uh, one of these phytoplankton that you may have seen or may have had the pleasure of seeing at, at times um, uh, is something called Noctiluca scintillans. Um, it's sometimes called sea sparkle and it's also known as a red tide. Uh, this particular photo taken by one of our, uh, uh, one of our environment and science team uh, is actually at, down at Point Addis and it shows a very large aggregation or a very large bloom of Noctiluca um, as it approached that coastline. Uh, we were getting calls uh, from people concerned that somebody had spilled a whole lot of oil or red paint on the surface. It was actually quite a natural event, uh, during, usually during the summertime, when these plankton can actually increase in uh, incredible numbers, reproduce in incredible numbers, and actually be quite visible on the surface of the water. Why they're called sea sparkle? Because if you've ever been down to the beach at night or been swimming at night and you've seen these little flashes of light in the water or uh, when you see a, a big uh, aggregation like in this particular image, um, the water literally as you move your hands or your feet or a boat moves through it, get these incredible phosphorescent displays. Really is quite something to behold. Let's talk now about macroalgae. Macroalgae is just another name for the word that's often used, seaweeds. I'm not a big fan of the use of the word seaweeds because it sounds like they're actually something that, that's a problem. And I guess for early navigators and for people who are trying to move boats through areas, um, it was a bit of a problem because you had to get your way through it and clog up your, your motor or get caught in your rudder, et cetera, um, and certainly have a bit of inconvenience value. But really we're talking about here a group of simple uh, living things. Uh, they're not the true plants, the flowering plants that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, these are actually algae. Uh, quite simple organisms in many ways, although they've taken uh, through evolutionary time uh, to a huge diversity of different sorts of forms. Here in Southern Australia, we have an incredible diversity 
of these macroalgae or seaweeds. We've got more than a thousand species of macroalgae across southern Australia, which is higher than the diversity of any other coastline in the world. Someone once told me that it was um, in all of North America, there are around about 400 species of marine algae, whereas in Victoria, we have pretty close to the 4,000 species. So in our tiny little state, we have got this incredible diversity. And the important thing there, that word end endemic, is that 65% of them are found nowhere else on the planet apart from here in Southern Australia. They come in those colour forms we've talked about briefly, uh, the reds, the greens, the browns, and there's another group that live up on the coastline, uh, the blue-green algae that live around the uh, intertidal or the upper intertidal area. And they live both intertidally and they also live down uh, to the areas where light can actually reach. Remember, however, that these are plants. So once you get beyond that sort of, certainly in Victorian waters, beyond about 25, 30 metres or so, there really isn't sufficient light uh, for these plants to be able to grow, these algae to be able to grow. Um, instead, we start to move into areas where animals uh, rule the world. A few basic terms, just a couple of things that you might be uh, interested in knowing about. Um, here's a couple of uh, quite common uh, types of algae. On the left is one that's called ulva. Um, otherwise known as sea lettuce. It's very familiar to people, particularly around Port Phillip Bay. Um, and certainly during springtime, we see a lot of alga growing uh, across the, uh, right across the Victorian coast. It's a, a sheet-like plant, and I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. On the right, you have what we might call a proper kelp. Um, and it's quite different in many ways. It does have a number of structures or features, which I'll hopefully be able to demonstrate it for you in a moment. It has large blades, um, not true leaves as such. They're called blades. It has small floats called pneumatocysts, which actually help to hold it up in the water column because they're quite big plants. Um, the uh, the macrocystis, the giant kelp itself, can grow in some parts of the world up to around about uh, 25, 30 metres or so from the sea floor up towards the surface. And it's those uh, pneumatocysts or those floats or air bladders that hold it vertically in the water and stop it from slumping down on itself. Pretty important. In Tasmania, on the east coast of Tasmania, the giant kelp used to be quite abundant, but with climate change, and the changing, the changing conditions in the sea, it's now actually become quite a difficult plant to be able to find. Let's have a bit of a look at what some of these features. So down at the base, you've got a special structure. These are not roots in the same way that plants have roots. They're called holdfasts. Uh, and it means, as the name suggests, they are holding tightly onto the bottom of the sea floor. They're basically a structure to stop the plant from being pulled off by the waves and drifting, drifting away. Pretty important structure, particularly in an environment like um, the one we have here in Victoria. So I'll switch my camera back on again, and I've got a couple of plants I'd like to share with you. So as I started showing a moment ago, We've got, I've got my kelp still here, but I thought I'd just go through and give you a, a couple of examples of some of the plants that we do actually find uh, living in this environment. Let's just start with some of the green ones. Again, sea lettuce, uh, the one that uh, pretty common along the coastline. This is a long stringy version, uh, but this is particularly common around rock pools. And as I mentioned a moment ago, during springtime, it uh, forms uh, quite large. You can see it all over the coastline, basically. Some people say you can eat it. I find it tastes a little bit like uh, plate eating plastic, it's not that great to, to eat, but you know, apparently it is it is edible. Here's one of my favourite ones, and when I talk about plants that you can eat in the sea, uh, this is a beautiful one called Darwin's Bubbles. I won't bore you with the scientific names of it, but this is a this is a lovely plant. It's made up of little tiny green beads. They're probably not quite uh, good enough magnification on the screen you're looking at. Uh, I actually enjoy eating it. Um, I reckon this is one that we could probably start to use more in salads and things if you can find it washed up on the beach. Definitely not from a marine protected area, of course. Mm, crunchy. It's a bit like um, it's a bit like I've got a cucumber taste to it. Yes, I'll have some more of that. Dinner is coming soon, and that's what the parsley was for earlier. With our brown seaweeds, I've already introduced you to the um, the common kelp or clonia, found right across temperate Australia from one one side from the east all the way across to the to the west. And it's probably our most dominant plant on many of the reefs right across southern Australia. But there are a couple of others as well that I wanted to show you. Uh, here's another one called Cystophora. And in particular, I wanted to point out 
uh, these little beads. I mentioned the moment ago, uh, the pneumatocysts, which um, basically help the plant. They're like having a basically a built-in set of floaties for holding this thing up in the water, stopping it from slumping down and allowing that beautiful plant to hold itself up in the water column uh, in order to be able to get sunlight. Let's get rid of some of these plants as I go to end up, I'm going to end up with them all over the place. Uh, here's another type of cystophora, a different species altogether. But again, if you look closely, you can see it's got these fantastic little beads um, full of air and that holds them up there on the surface. Now, I mentioned the red algae a moment ago. So we've got these beautiful red algae. These are generally found in areas where there's, they're either in deeper water or sometimes under the edges of ledges and things where the light is not nearly as strong as what it is uh, in, the open, uh, in the open water environment itself. But these beautiful red plants, again, incredibly diverse. Many of them are found nowhere else in the world apart from here in Southern Australia. Um, and just quickly, before I go back to the slides, just wanted to show you a couple of holdfasts. Uh, these ones are just from plants that washed up on the beach. Here's one from the common kelp. Um, and you can see it's a magnificent looking structure there. Those little tiny fingers at the base allow it to literally crevice themselves, hold themselves into nooks and crannies and really, you know, as the waves are washing backwards and forwards, it allows those plants to be able to withstand. And interestingly, quite often you'll find, such as in this example here, I'm getting water all over my computer screen, so anyway, I hope it doesn't blow up any second. But you might be able to see in this particular case, this little tiny holdfast at the base of a bit of cystophora, but it's actually broken away uh, with the rocks still attached to it. So the rock actually gave way uh, rather than this super glued, uh, fantastic seaweed, which is bedded on the, on the sea floor. So I hope you found that. And look, you can find these sorts of things just uh, uh, when I go to the beach, I quite often spend my time looking at those great, great big piles of seaweed that wash up on the beach uh, because they really are the most wonderful things to sort of dig through. And there's a whole lot of treasures that you'll find uh, hidden within those. Let's get back into the presentation. So we'll go back. Uh, we've just talked a bit about some of those plants. Um, and just look, I'll run through these fairly briefly just to give you a bit of an idea of some of the things. So the green algae, uh, they're in a group of their own or a phylum of their own chlor chlorophyta, having those typical uh, pigments that we find in plants on the land. The brown algae, again, with those extra pigments that allow them to absorb water in deeper light, include things like the magnificent bull kelp uh, that we saw that beautiful uh, basket uh, in the uh, introductory slide. Um, they also include one that's very common to many people uh, around the bay and on the open coastline. This is a tidal uh, plant called, uh, often called Neptune's necklace, um, which um, basically is full of uh, these little beads. Uh, and those beads, rather than actually be full of air, are actually full of seawater, allowing it to cope quite well uh, with long periods in between the tide where it's exposed uh, to the air to prevent themselves from drying out. Interestingly, if you look closely, um, at the um, at the surface of those little beads, you can actually see the reproductive structures where the uh, gametes, the sperm and eggs uh, from this particular seaweed uh, are actually coming from. Uh, these, this, make, this is a, a beautiful shot from Pope's eye of, of a clonia uh, forming that fantastic uh, forest-like environment below the surface. A Sibstophora here off Barwon Head, and if you look to the background, you can see the bull kelp in the background there. Uh, we've also got uh, this fantastic plant, the giant kelp, that's actually my wife, I'll introduce you to her a little bit later on, uh, snorkeling in what's left of uh, Victoria's macrocystis, the giant kelp areas. And these materials are actually important food for a whole range of different sorts of living things. Um, on the very far left, we've got um, some abalone, one of our most important uh, marine animals in terms of fishing in Victoria. These are basically very, very large snails that spend their time, uh, particularly as adults living in and underneath reefs, uh, capturing uh, bits of broken off algae uh, with their fantastic uh, foot um, and using that as their primary source of food. In the centre, you can obviously see there a southern rock lobster. This is quite a large rock, rock lobster uh, in one of our marine protected areas. And again, those southern rock lobsters, they actually are scavengers. They'll feed on a broad range of different things, including uh, fragments of algae when things are tough. And on the right, uh, we've got uh, the icon of last year's Great Victorian fish count, uh, probably the most feisty fish you'll find uh, anywhere um, related to the damselfish up in Queensland. For those of you who know uh, the damselfish, quite aggressive fish, 
This is actually a gardening fish. Um, it actually cultivates particular patches of its own uh, favourite varieties of seaweeds. It uses those um, and keeps the other uh, keeps other types of seaweed from growing there. It comes back um, and guards its little patch of seaweeds uh, very, very actively and keeps other other things like other fish um, and even snorkels and divers occasionally uh, by chasing them away. So it's trying to do uh, when we took this photo, it's actually chasing me away. Um, the red algae, as I've mentioned, uh, generally tend to live in sort of uh, either in deeper waters or also in areas where there's quite a lot of shade, such as in this image here, where you can actually see a lot of this beautiful pink crusting growth over the surface of the rock, uh, which actually is a type of algae uh, living there called the coralline algae. You can also see um, some more filamentous types of algae. Again, this is down in the Bowen Bluff Marine Sanctuary uh, with that more folio softer form. Um, the coralline algae, interestingly, have actually got a shell-like structure around them, which allows them to survive very well living in quite harsh environments. And they are also found uh, living in the intertidal area, uh, again, because of that calcified out exterior that allows them to uh, survive quite well without water and prevent themselves from drying out. I would be remiss of me not to talk about the other plants that are also found in Victoria. So we've got things like sea grasses. These are actually flowering plants, um, quite distinct from the algae. They have true roots, they have uh, stems, they have conductive tissue, and importantly, uh, being flowering plants, they actually have flowers and they set seed, which is quite different, as we'll see in a moment, uh, to the marine algae um, who, who reproduce in a very, very different kind of way. These sea grasses are incredibly important, and this shot taken out at Mud Islands and the seagrass meadows out there um, to show some uh, some volunteers actually out searching, doing some seagrass monitoring. Uh, they store carbon. They are incredibly important places for uh, fish and for other animals to breed. Um, they're, they're of enormous social and economic value. And unfortunately, in many parts of Victoria, uh, they are threatened by water quality, water that derives from our streets or from our farms. Um, actually can create conditions which make it very challenging for seagrasses to survive. As I mentioned, seagrasses are particularly important as nurseries. Um, and this little school of fish out of Mud Islands, a group of yellow eye mullet, um, again, a juvenile fish, which uh, again will grow eventually once they reach a, a bit of size and move away from those areas. But they depend, like many other species, on that seagrass for the early part of their life. And of course, there's some of our iconic species that we find in our marine environment, seahorses and sea dragons that can also be found living in these areas as well. The last group I want to touch on in terms of marine plants are the mangroves, because these really are forests. They are trees, basically, although in Victoria, um, sometimes uh, Queenslanders get a little bit, um, a little bit sort of uh, a bit challenged by our mangroves because they certainly don't grow to the size that they do up in Queensland. They have a number of different species in Queensland. Here in Victoria, we have one species, uh, Avicennia marina. Um, and as the name suggests, it's a plant that's particularly well coped, uh, uh, suited for living in marine environments. In this above and below shot, you can actually see what it looks like below the surface of the water as well as above the water. Um, they have special adaptations for them to cope with a life in a, a very harsh environment. Um, not only do they have uh, these uh, wonderful trunks, they have these fantastic sort of little stems that poke up out of the sand or out of the mud uh, called pneumatophores, which are actually like a set of snorkels for the roots. Uh, being in, often growing in thick airless mud, these plants basically have special adaptations to allow them to get oxygen to their roots uh, through these special breathing, breathing roots or these uh, snorkel-like roots uh, which form their structures. So hopefully that gave you a bit of an understanding of some of the diversity of things that we find there. Going to finish up, I uh, uh, just want to spend a bit of time talking about some of the threats to Victorian kelp forests, some of the work that Parks Victoria, our partners and our communities are actually concerned about at the moment in terms of things that are actually starting to change or starting to cause concern in terms of the health of some of these environments. One of the greatest threats to Victoria's marine biodiversity are actually animals and plants that come from overseas or other countries. We have quite a number of them. Um, as you can see on the very left-hand side, some of the more serious ones, the priority of concern for us are, are Japanese uh, kelp or the Andaria pinnatifida, uh, the Northern Pacific sea star, a very voracious predator, um, green shore crabs, which are pretty much naturalized and have been here for over 100 years, um, and Pacific oysters, which are actually now starting to pop up more and more, uh, both in Western Port, Port Phillip Bay, and down in South Gippsland. We also have a number of what we might call overabundant native species or species basically that are native to Australia, 
but are starting to increase quite dramatically in terms of the numbers and having very adverse effects on the local plants and animals that should be in those particular areas. And we'll talk specifically about two of them, uh, the purple urchin and the black spined urchin. The purple urchin is a particular problem in Port Phillip Bay, oops, um, and the um, a black spined urchin is a big problem, uh, particularly in far eastern Victoria at the moment, although with climate change, we're concerned that this thing's going to gradually move, uh, move its way westwards. Um, one of the plants that uh, is, is of great concern is actually introduced seaweeds. The one on the left is common kelp or a clonia. Um, this is the one that really does form a lot of canopy and a lot of structure in Victorian kelp uh, in Victorian rocky reefs. The one on the right is a close up of an introduced plant, the Undaria I was talking about a moment ago. This is a plant that originated in Northeast Asia, uh, spread through international shipping to Tasmanian waters and has now established itself in Victoria. It was first discovered in Victoria in the late uh, 1990s. It's now spread from Port Phillip Bay. Uh, in fact, it's most areas of Port Phillip Bay all the way down to the Port Phillip Heads Marine National Park. And our team at Queenscliff have been doing some great work looking at trialling different methods for controlling it at Pope's Eye, a very important component um, of the Port Phillip Heads Marine National Park where people do a lot of snorkeling and diving. Um, but this particular plant has actually now spread itself uh, via vessels all the way to Apollo Bay where it's popped up. Um, and more recently, in the last couple of years, it's also turned up in Port Welshpool uh, down in South Gippsland. The main mechanism for this particular plant to spread is via vessels um, and by gear. And one of the things that we've been trying to encourage people to very, uh, very much think about when they talk about preventing or helping being part of the solution rather than part of the problem is to just keep the gear clean, keep your boat clean uh, by checking it, making sure that you're not carrying some of these things, by washing things in fresh water and of course drying things out which prevents any sort of marine life from being able to be transmitted from one place to another. Um, here's a shot taken at Pope's Eye a couple of years ago, uh, the beautiful Victorian scaly fin, the little feisty fish I was talking about and the plant that you can see growing through here at the moment is that, uh, sorry, that is that Undaria. Um, it's essentially replacing, I don't know what's going on, I've just lost my, but my wet fingers are actually not helping on the, uh, the screen. Let me just go back to the right slide yeah. to dry my screen. There we go. Uh, so the plant you can actually see there is actually um, Undaria growing and it's starting, to, because it grows very rapidly, it's starting to colonise. Um, it does grow incredibly rapidly during the, uh, during the sort of later parts of winter through to summer. It then dies off. Uh, it means it creates a habitat and then all of a sudden it's gone again. So it's a big problem. And we've actually got a, a number of places in Port Phillip Bay where we're trying to manage that one at the moment. I did mention, and again, I won't get too technical here, but um, one of the big challenges for, for um, this particular plant is it has these two quite different uh, generations of its life cycle. For those of you who know about ferns, you'll know that they have a sporophyte phase which produces spores, and it also has a gametophyte phase which produces um, e uh, sperm and eggs. And this is actually what um, act allows this plant to survive and spread so easily. Even the tiny little plants that you can't see attach themselves to boat hulls, to, to structures that get moved from one place to another and can spread very quickly in that way. Another big problem for us here in, uh, in Victoria is actually climate change. Now, I'm not sure whether you're actually a believer or you're not a believer, but we are certainly seeing the evidence. These two images are side by side. The one on the left is actually showing the actual temperature with uh, warmer water in the reds to cooler water in the blues. Um, and on the right hand side, it's showing the variation between normal with four degrees above normal uh, in red and uh, down in the blue, it's four degrees less than normal. But what I want you to notice in particular are these, some of these large patches of warm water that are now reaching down. This is the eastern part of Victoria over near Gabo Island. Um, and this big variation starting to pop up here where you can see this warm water starting to pulse and make its way into the eastern part of Bass Strait. And sometimes even reaching all the way through almost uh, to Wilson's Promontory. These are very concerning because they're changing the temperature of the water. It means that the living things that are in those water in the water column are responding also. Look at that big pulse of uh, warm water starting to pop up there. This is in July, so we're talking here about the a seasonally warm water that's four degrees warmer than what it should be. 
And this is something that we're starting to see periodically far more often is this increase in the strength of the East Australian current, otherwise known as the Nemo current that many of you would be familiar with, uh, moving its way not only into Victoria, but also onto the east coast of Tasmania as well. Um, one of the things that's actually started to disappear, as I mentioned earlier on, is this macrocystis, where we've actually seen a marked decline, something like 90% of the macrocystis forests that used to be in Victoria and also on the east coast of Tasmania are no longer there. And it's very much got to do with this warming water, changes in the nutrient regimes that impacts on this particular plant. The other consequence has been that it's allowed certain types of animals to do particularly well. And the black spined urchin I mentioned a moment ago um, is one of the beneficiaries where only a, a degree or so warmer in temperature allows many more of its larvae to actually survive. These things then uh, can change environments such as this beautiful kelp forest in Beware Reef where our volunteers, the Friends of Beware Reef, quite a number of years ago started noticing the decline of this kelp forest in quite a short period of time where these beautiful kelp forests supporting things like the beautiful draft board shark you can see here started to change quite dramatically and started to eat literally the seaweed or destroy the forest, remove the forest. And just as if you clear fell the forest, uh, the homes for many of the animals and plants that should be there uh, start to disappear. So while there seems to be quite a lot of fish life in there, uh, the lack of plants mean that there's not that productivity that you'd experiencing earlier. As we look, um, Look a bit further, you can start to see in this little clip here, uh, this is our friends at uh, Friends of Beware Reef actually uh, doing some survey work, starting to actually do some uh, trials of culling. We've been very fortunate in the last couple of years to be working with some partners. Uh, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning has provided some funding. Uh, community groups have been helping. We're working with Deakin and Melbourne universities to trial different methods for controlling and restoring kelp forest habitats. Uh, some of the work we've been able to do is including to actually uh, do a very large scale environments. It might be cruel, very main way of disposing of the urchins, and in doing so, what you see now is actually restoration. Here's some of the science we've been that sits behind this. Back in 2018, we were getting around seven or so urchins per square metre. Um, a year or so, a couple of years later, after the uh, after the culling, you can start to see some of the plants coming back. And just in April this year, this is what it's the, exactly the same site actually looks like now. So by removing the urchin down to nearly, you know, it's less than less than one urchin per square metre, we're actually starting to see some of that kelp forest actually starting to restore. Here's a little bit of vision just to show you what it looks like. And what I really want you to notice here is the very large numbers of tiny little kelp plants that are starting to pop up all over the place kelp babies we might call them, but what we're starting to see here is that these ecosystems can actually be restored by some proactive management by actually controlling the urchins and allowing that full kelp forest environment to be restored. In Port Phillip Bay, we're seeing a similar pattern, but not with the black urchin as we talked about earlier, but a purple spined urchin, uh, particularly in the marine sanctuaries around the northern part of the bay. Again, just to give you an idea, this is uh, this is at Point Cook Marine Sanctuary on the western side of Port Phillip Bay. You can see a few plants in here. Uh, interestingly, there's a bit of sea lettuce there you might recognise from earlier on. Uh, the Japanese kelp or the Undaria seems to be doing particularly well, I guess because the urchins don't like it. But just notice the very large number of these spiky urchins uh, living all over the ground. If you look closer, you'll see uh, many of them have got little, uh, because there's not a lot of cover there, you've actually got uh, bits of shell or something sitting on the top of them, but they're all out in the open. And there's that Undaria that I was talking about that's very much helped along by, by the sea urchins. Just to give you an idea of how things have changed quite dramatically over time, um, here is kelp forest environment and a couple of bare sandy patches where the kelp, this is at uh, Williamstown, Bo Morris um, and Point Cook, but you can see the green line of where the kelp forest edge used to be back in the 1980s or the 70s or even the 50s um, and where it is now. That dramatic decrease in terms of the area of kelp and all of it's largely got to do with sea urchins. Our partners at Deakin University and Melbourne University have been working with us closely to help us map and try and better understand what we can actually do about this as an issue. And they've recently mapped uh, both the Point Cook job and marine sanctuaries in Port Phillip Bay. And we're looking now at involving, uh, getting uh, volunteers involved and in helping us to remove the urchins to allow that kelp to recover. 
So our program really is to try and encourage community groups to get involved, community people to get involved. We've got some funding available now and we're looking to, or we've applied for some funding to try and get some large scale culling underway, but we'll continue to monitor these sites and look at how essentially we can get some of that kelp, that important kelp forest habitat uh, back into those uh, beautiful marine sanctuaries within the bay. Last thing I want to finish with is just where can you get out and enjoy these fantastic environments. There are lots of places in Victoria where kelp forests can be seen. You don't have to be a scuba diver. Uh, beautiful uh, areas along our coastline happen to have fantastic places for snorkeling, uh, such as down here in Bowen Heads in the Bowen Bluff Marine Sanctuary. A wetsuit, clearly important. It's chilly in Victoria, in case you're not aware of it. Um, and you know, a good mask and snorkel. A pair of fins is also very helpful, but uh, certainly um, I'd be putting on a slightly uh, warmer uh, wetsuit at this time of the year. I did say I was going to introduce you back to my wife again. This is a uh, this is a Point Lonsdale uh, a few years ago. Um, some of you might have seen this little clip earlier on the uh, Victoria Nature Festival's website that I kindly put the YouTube clip up there. But it's actually snorkeling through uh, the giant kelp forest that's right at the very end of the reef at the lighthouse at Point Lonsdale. And you can see that fantastic forest-like environment. You can see all those beautiful uh, nematocysts, those floats holding it up in the water, that beautiful golden colour. And I really say to a lot of people, get out there and have a look at this stuff while it's still there, because it's certainly disappearing, unfortunately, very, very rapidly. It is really one of the fantastic environments. And I did say, you know, it's like going for a walk in the forest. Uh, well, it's actually better than going for a walk in the forest. In this place, you can see the current streaming through. It's, it's like flying uh, through a forest in the underwater environment. Really quite spectacular. So get out there and enjoy those beautiful kelp forests. There are lots of places across Victoria. Many of our marine protected areas do have these particular uh, kelp forest environments that you can actually go out and explore. And I just encourage you to get out there, uh, you know, perhaps wait a while or, or certainly get yourself a good wetsuit. Uh, but places uh, all around the bay, all the three marine sanctuaries in the bay, Port Phillip Heads, and then right across the open coast, most of our marine protected areas, there are some exceptions, uh, do have good kelp forest for you to explore. Be safe. Another way of, of getting involved is to actually uh, to join a volunteer group to get involved in citizen science programs such as our sea search program or activities run by the great uh, run by the Victoria National Parks Association, such as in the bottom right hand corner, the great Victorian fish count that happens every year, usually around December. You can also get involved in a very different level. The gentleman in the top right hand corner is a wonderful, a wonderful volunteer called Don Love, the president of the Friends of Beware Reef, uh, who actually wrote a diver's guide and an ID guide. And I encourage anyone who's interested in having a look at plants and animals that live in the Port Phillip Heads Marine National Park to go onto our park's website uh, and you can download those, uh, those books there. There are lots of other volunteer activities that are happening, sea search programs, fish counts, etc. They're all advertised on Park Connect, which is our volunteer web page. And I just encourage you, if you're interested in this, to either come along and do some activities with us or join many of the wonderful volunteer groups that operate across Victoria. They'd be very welcoming and very uh, able to help you make those connections with our underwater environments. So thank you for listening. I know I've almost gone to time, so we'll just have to rush through the questions, unfortunately. But there's look, there's a there's probably a thousand people that should be on this page that I tried to indicate everyone who I'd, I'd pinched photos from or borrowed photos from, and I got a bunch. Uh, got a whole bunch off the web. You can see uh, Ranger Mike Irvine up there in Boo Air Reef inspecting the regrowing kelp forest. I think the draft board shark that's sitting next to him is enjoying the view as well and seeing that wonderful kelp forest restored. So thank you for listening. And uh, Nicola, I will turn my other screen back on now and hopefully there's a couple of questions there that we can uh, we can work through in time. You certainly do have a few questions, Mark. Uh, the first question that came up was what what's the largest marine park in Victoria? So the largest marine national park in Victoria is actually at Wilson's Promontory and I, I do use that word quite intentionally marine national park because we do have a couple of marine parks as well and one of them happens to be at Wilson's Promontory so just to make sure we're talking about the same the right thing uh, the Wilson's Promontory Marine National Park is around about 15,000 hectares or so it extends from uh, just south of uh, Tidal River all the way around through to uh, to Waterloo Bay on the other side for those of you who know it and it is actually one of those magnificent environments it's actually represents an area that is um, you know it's connected to a national park on the land so when you think about the protection from the top of Mount Oberon to the bottom of 
uh, I guess the bottom of the sea, often the Marine National Park, it's forms one of the most inti intact protected areas anywhere on the planet. And we we're very fortunate a few years ago to have Wilson Promontory Marine National Park listed as the only Australian marine protected area in the Blue Park Scheme. So it's actually one of only a handful of parks around the world that's recognised for both its biodiversity as well as for its good management. But that's the park that's largest. Fabulous. Uh, another question was, how many types of macroalgae are edible? That's a really good question. I don't think actually um, there's actually been full enough research, particularly for our Austra Southern Australian marine uh, uh, macroalgae, uh, macroalgae. Quite a number of them. The one I talked about, as I said, I reckon this is this is an absolute winner. I'll just have another little snack on that one. The, uh, uh, this beautiful Darwin's bubbles one, crunch, crunch. Um, but that one's that one's just an example of them. But there are a whole bunch of soft red algae that are. I've tried this. There's one. You, you're probably going to be thinking I'm eating too much seaweed, but. Um, uh, but there's one that tastes like strawberry pancakes. Uh, yeah, that's true. It's a beautiful sheet-like algae, quite rare. It only washes up occasionally. You tend to see it more diving, but when you do see this, this beautiful sort of flat sheet thing with little tiny holes, have a little nibble and see what you see what you reckon. I don't think there are any that are particularly toxic, so I'd suggest you get out there and just try a few. But look, um, in other parts of the world, marine algae are incredibly important parts of people's diet. Uh, the problem plant I talked about earlier, the Andaria, is actually the world's most important and most uh, economically valuable marine plant, and it's eaten widely across uh, particularly northeastern Asia. But um, many of you would be familiar with, with that one. It comes in things like miso soup you, in the little package you get. There's another one that uh, it's a red algae that's pressed and dried. It's made into nori sheets, which is used. There's another one. Uh, the the air, people in, in um, northeast Asia, particularly um, have a lot of diversity. They've been very fortunate to visit Korea on a couple of occasions. And again, their knowledge of marine plants, their cultivation of marine plants is quite extraordinary. In Indonesia now, they're cultivating another marine plant called limu. Uh, again, a really valuable plant, not only for food, but also many of these plants are actually have got other benefits. So even things like the bull kelp, uh, the alginates that are extracted from these things are actually often added to materials as emulsifiers or gelling agents. And you'll often find when you look closely at the label of things that there are actually things that come, derive from seaweed. So look, I think in answer to the question, there are lots. I don't I have a definitive number for you, uh, but many different marine plants have actually got important uses for people. Brilliant. Uh, another question, what are the, some of the ways other than reducing litter that we can do to protect the diversity and health of our bays and oceans, please? Oh, how long have I got, uh, Nicola? <laughs> <laughs> no time at all. <laughs> no time at all. all right, well, I know we're already over time and apologies if you have to go and get get the kids dinner ready or whatever, by all means uh, do so. We've recorded this session, so hopefully if you do have to leave, you can leave and know the comfort that your question, if it's still coming, uh, will be answered. But look, in terms of looking after the marine environment, there are lots of different things we can do both when we go to the coast but also at home as well. And I like to start thinking what you can do at home are some of the most important things. We all connect to the marine environment through our waterways, what goes down our drains, what goes down our sinks, what goes down, uh, you know, go, goes down the system basically ends up in the bay. And whether it's, you know, litter, it's um, it's dog poo, that's a big issue, particularly for someone like Port Phillip Bay after a big heavy rain, uh, after a long period of dry, the amount of dog poo that ends up in the waterways and uh, down in the water there uh, adds nutrients to those environments. If you're a gardener or a farmer, um, you can look after the marine environment by actually looking after your land and, and uh, making sure that your fertilisers stay where they're supposed to do, by making sure that our waterways are protected, they have got good vegetation around the sides. You can also do a lot of things down at the uh, coast itself. I mentioned earlier things like, for example, stopping the spread of marine pests. It's a really simple thing to do is to remember that if you take your boat, particularly somewhere, all your snorkeling gear or, or your wetsuit from somewhere like Port Phillip Bay and you decide to go from, you know, go for a drive down to, say, beautiful Wilson's Prom Marine National Park, um, you know, you can very easily transport some of those gametes, some of those uh, larval stages, some of those uh, propagules of some of the marine pests. So, you know, simple things like washing your gear in fresh water, which you should do anyway, look after your, look after your stuff, but 
But importantly, because it kills freshwater, kills marine life, and it kills uh, the uh, propagules of some of these marine pests, you can help us a lot by stopping the spread of marine pests. Look, there's a couple of, in a nutshell, very, very simple things that we can all do. So think about the water, uh, water, the way water flows into the bays. The big puddle at the bottom of the hill is connected to us all up here on the land. But also when you're down at the beach, very respectful, protect those marine national parks and marine sanctuaries. These are no-take areas. They're 5% of the coast set aside for the future, basically. Respect those things. If you want to go fishing, there's 95% of the coast where you can do that sort of activity, but leave some of the areas alone as well. These are just a couple of things. Fantastic. Uh, Alicia has a question. On dry land, pest weedy grasses can be hand weeded or sprayed. How do you manage the non-native pest kelp and algae? That is, uh, if you could come up with the answer for that one, look, we'd love to know about it because it's hard. It's just straight hard. Marine plants like Undaria, it's really difficult control. We've been doing some trials now for nearly five years, I think it was since it first turned up there, where the local team at Queenscliff have been doing some great work. Initially, we were just pulling the whole things out, but there were risks there that we were actually helping to, to spread it through some of the spores that were coming out of the plants we were removing. Uh, so um, one of my colleagues, uh, former colleagues, has actually developed a technique of removing the reproductive sections and, and then removing the plants that way. So look, at the moment, it's largely ha by hand. It's actually diving and it's quite difficult and not only difficult but sometimes can be quite expensive uh, to operate particularly when this plant grows anything down to about 12 meters as we do have in some parts of the Port Phillip Heads Marine National Park. So the short answer is it's not easy. If you can come up with a solution um, we'd be love to hear about it. At the moment we're trialing methods for looking at how we might be able to control these plants going forward but at the moment there's no simple answer. Thanks, Mark. And Loretta has asked, how many shark species are there? World or in Victoria or? <laughs> Start with Vic. <laughs> well, I don't actually know, I haven't counted them, but there's, I think there's, I think there's around about 30, 30 different sharks and they range from some of the uh, some of the more well-known ones, such as the ones I showed you a couple of pictures of earlier on, the, the, the big end of things. So you've got your, your great white sharks at the top end, uh, right through to very small sharks that are relatively common. And I did, there was a bit of footage, I think, earlier in this presentation as well with uh, the Port Jackson shark uh, swimming through the kelp forest. You might recall that one, uh, quite a harmless shark that, that tends to be quite common around Port Phillip Bay at places like um, at places like Ricketts Point Marine Sanctuary or over at uh, Point Cook Marine Sanctuary, relatively common. Uh, there are a number of other uh, shark species that, that come into and out of the bay quite regularly. So things like our school sharks and our gummy sharks, uh, there's some beautiful little long looking sharks that look a bit more like a, I guess a bit like an eel. They're a long skinny sort of thing, but they're definitely a shark called cat, sh cat sharks, rusty cat sharks. Uh, there's other small, small sharks, harmless, that can swallow water and puff themselves up to make themselves look really big and scary, called not surprisingly swell sharks. Um, there's a whole diversity of things. And then of course, don't forget about their very close cousins, the rays. Um, sharks and rays sort of go pretty much together with each other. Um, there's really quite a big diversity of sharks. So I'd say you know, roughly 25 to 30 species of sharks, probably around about the same number, of, a few more rays. Um, and then there's another group altogether in belong in that same general uh, group of the uh, cartilaginous fish uh, called um, the chimeras or the things like the elephant fish, which we have sometimes called elephant shark, comes into Western Port, um, some of the estuaries during uh, during the winter time, and it's a uh, sought after commercial species sometimes. Um, but yeah, very, very unusual. But most of its relatives live in deep water environments. So look, they're a big group. Um, yeah, some great, uh, great diversity there in terms of our shark life here in Victoria. And look, the important message is that most of them are actually quite harmless. Uh, there are some clearly you need to be aware of in terms of their potential for causing human harm. Um, I was just having a chat with my wife last night as they, we were having a bit of a problem with mosquitoes down here on the coast at the moment. And we know people with dengue fever at the moment. We know people with Ross River fever. And we know people have just got Bensdale ulcers, all of which are linked to the little tiny thing called a mosquito. The mosquito is, um, as we were reading, uh, the most dangerous animal on the planet. Sharks have certainly got a bad rap for that. But um, yeah, I reckon the little mozzies are probably a hell of a lot worse. Very good point. Uh, we have quite a few questions, so we may need to uh, perhaps send some Q and A's out after this is completed. I'll I'll do one more. Um, Pip has asked which community organisations get involved with urchin culling. 
Okay, so look, this is a program I actually had a chat this afternoon with Ellie for uh, one of our rangers at Williamstown, uh, specifically on this one. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, there was the intended to be urchin culling programs in Port Phillip Bay Marine Sanctuaries kicking off in the next few months, but you know, the thing that's keeping us all at home, and you can see I'm, I'm working in, in the, off the kitchen table where I've been pretty much for 18 months as well, um, but um, the program is due to, to sort of commence when it's possible. Um, Ellie was just saying that they've still to do some of their baseline surveys at, at Ricketts Point and similarly at Jawbone Marine Sanctuary, which is just near Williamstown. Uh, there are plans to do some urchin culling at both of those. Uh, the two marine care groups, or in fact, the three marine care groups in the Bay, uh, Marine Care Ricketts Point, probably the biggest and most well known, jump on their website to find them. Uh, marine Care Jawbone and Marine Care Point Cook have all got intentions to work with us. Uh, we've developed a, a management plan for actually looking at how we're going to do, be doing this, the methods for doing this, um, and they're currently uh, looking for volunteers to sign up uh, their, or at least express their interest in being involved when uh, we get back in the water and can actually start doing this work. So they're the three groups that I'll be looking for mo at, uh, at the moment. Uh, there's some other work happening in South Gippsland um, in the Nurumunga Marine and Coastal Park to do with urchins in seagrass areas, which I didn't talk about. And there's also been long-term involvement of the Friends of Beware Reef over at um, over near Orbost in, in Eastern Victoria, looking at the big black spined urchins. Uh, but certainly in the coming future, uh, again, when it's possible, uh, some of those programs in Port Phillip Bay will commence. And again, check, keep, keep your eye on, on Park, Web, um, Park Web and Park Connect in particular, uh, but most importantly, make contact with the groups uh, that are actually working in those areas through, uh, find their websites and uh, make connections that way. Fantastic. Now, do we wanna, we're, we're over time, so would you like to do a Q&A <laughs> uh, fact sheet perhaps after? I can clearly uh, probably talk underwater, but uh, anyway, that's a, that's another story. But look, I might let people get to their dinner. Um, if people have got specific questions that they'd like, uh, like to have answered, um, you don't need to put this in the published, uh, um, Nicola, but if you want to just put your name next to, uh, put your name and your email address, I'll be very happy in the next couple of days. I won't promise I'll do it tomorrow, um, but certainly happy to have a bit of a go. If you can put your email address into the uh, to the chat or, um, and again, we won't publish these ones, so you still say keep yourself anonymous. Um, I'll be very happy to have a look through those, uh, get the uh, download of the report afterwards and have a look at the questions and see which ones I can help you out with. And of course, uh, don't forget, as I said at the beginning, if you want to uh, get in touch, um, you can call anyone in Parks Victoria on 13 19 63. I'm quite reachable. Uh, my email address is mark.rodrigue at parks.vic.gov.au and happy to take email questions as well. Again, don't uh, don't expect the answer to come the next day. Um, I'll do my best to get to it as soon as I can. But no, thank you very much. Look, I might finish up then, Nicola, and just say thank you very much for being at the other end, the tech support and uh, the lifeline, basically. And hopefully, you didn't have too many uh, challenging uh, people connect uh, connection problems today. Uh, but look, I just want to thank everybody for joining us again. Uh, really, it is a fantastic marine environment we've got here in Victoria. There's lots of great ways to get out and enjoy it at a personal level or with your friends. Uh, you know, encourage the little ones. Our kids uh, started snorkeling when they were about five years old and they haven't looked back since. They're, they're just mad keen uh, water babies. Uh, they're, they're now they're nearly 30, so <laughs> they've been doing it for a while. Uh, but, you know, their kids, we've just got our granddaughter uh, in the water, got a red suit and a mask and snorkel for Christmas last year. And uh, in spite of COVID, we managed to get her in the water twice over the last summer. But get out there and enjoy our beautiful parks, our mag magnificent marine environments in Victoria. Get that lovely warm wetsuit, you'll need one. Uh, but also look at ways that you can actually get involved through some of the other things I've talked about, particularly through volunteering and joining some of our activities if that's your if that's your interest. But thank you so much for joining us and enjoy our marine protected areas across Victoria. And thanks again, Nicola. Right, I'm going to switch it off now then, Nicola. <laughs> Bye everybody.